There's some amazing things in this world. I'm going to show you some pictures, and I'm going to ask if somebody can turn down the lights so we can see these slides. George, can you hop up there and turn down the lights? I want you to check out these amazing animals. Now, this is a white peacock. Isn't it beautiful? It's found in Australia and India. And they're not albinos. There's just a genetic mutation which causes them to be totally white. Now, the next one, you know I'd have to have a frog. Some of you know I love frogs because frog stands for fully rely on God. I collect frogs. This is a tree frog. Isn't he beautiful? Pretty amazing. Or how about this ribbon worm? Is that awesome? Now, not only do these animals look amazing, some can do amazing things. Did you know that a giraffe can clean its own ears with its 21-inch tongue? Is that gross? Yeah. Or how about this? A flea can jump 350 times its body length, which is the equivalent of a human jumping the length of a football field. Is that amazing? Yeah. Okay, there's some amazing foods. Purple carrots. Anybody had a purple carrot? You have. That's awesome. They grow in Britain and Central Asia. And they're, they trace them back to the 10th century in Rome and Central Asia. I haven't seen those in the grocery stores. At the farmer's market, so they're growing them here. I'm going to have to check that out. Here's another amazing mood, red bananas. Those are grown in Australia. And actually, when they're ripe, the inside is really a pink. The flesh is a pink color. Okay, there's some amazing places. Now, this is a salt flat. That's not water. Okay, that is a salt flat where it just kind of goes into the sky. It creates like a mirror, and it's found in Bolivia. It mirrors the sky. Now, here's a pink lake. Isn't that fascinating? You know, when I think of a lake, I think of brown or green or blue. But this one's pink, and if you scoop a glass of water out of there, your glass will be pink, which is so fascinating. And it, it has to do, they think, with um, the high salt levels. Isn't that interesting? So if anybody goes to Australia, I want a picture of that. With flat Jesus. Okay, look at these lavender fields. Aren't they gorgeous? They're in Fredericksburg. Isn't that pretty? Now, here's some amazing facts. Like, did you know there are more life forms living on your skin? There are people on the planet. It's kind of gross, right? Okay, or did you know that every single day you'll eat 70 assorted insects while you sleep? Y'all are going to have trouble sleeping tonight, aren't you? Okay. Did you know that you are 1% shorter in the evening than in the morning? Did you know your height changes throughout the I didn't know that. Now, this one may not be so amazing to you, but you know it will take a 1,000 years to watch every video on YouTube? Some of you are trying, aren't you? I guess some of those kids over there are trying. <laughs> but have you ever thought about what it would take to amaze Jesus? Today, he, we read he was amazed by one thing, the faith of the centurion. Isn't it cool to think that the one who designed DNA and the one who designed photosynthesis and pink lakes and white peacocks could be amazed? Now, you probably think, come on, how could Jesus be amazed? He's God, right? What was it that made Jesus marvel or be astonished? Now, Jesus often amazed people with his words and actions, but only once in Scripture does it say, he was amazed by someone's faith. Now, one other time, Trisha told us he was amazed by someone's lack of faith. But this is the only time he was amazed by their faith, and that's the story Melissa read today. This is one of those really critical moments in the unfolding of the gospel story because it's not just a story drop, dropped randomly into the text. It's very important where this story falls because it is told immediately after Jesus has preached a sermon. The sermon that in Matthew is called the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. And if you remember, you'll know that Jesus in that sermon talked about what a disciple looked like in very clear terms. And he said that a true disciple was humble, repentant over sin, loved even his enemies, was generous, compassionate, and devoted to the Lord. We also heard in that sermon how Jesus contrasted that kind of faithfulness with the Jewish religious establishment. You remember the Jewish religious establishment was very self-righteous. They didn't see their own sin. They saw only their, what they thought was righteousness. They loved only those who loved them and whoever would benefit them. And so what you essentially had in this famous sermon of Jesus is a contrast between the Jewish establishment 
and their self-righteous system and a true disciple of Jesus Christ. So now, after he's told what it looks like, he gives us a living, breathing example of someone who is a true disciple. And he uses the least likely person, a Roman soldier, a pagan occupying the land, collecting taxes, the worst scenario possible. Of course, that's kind of Jesus' MO in it. Doesn't he always use the least likely person, like the Good Samaritan, to show what a true disciple is? Well, to understand it more fully, we need to know more about the centurion in those days. Now, you remember the Roman Empire controlled the known world at that time. And as Tricia told us this morning, the centurions were Roman soldiers, and they were over 100 men. Now, history books tell us that centurions were not the kind of person you wanted for your best friend because they were known to kill their best friends if it so moved them. But when we first hear about the centurion, we're told that his servant was highly valued by him. His slave was valued. In fact, the word used for highly valued is precious. His slave was precious to him. Really unusual. History books also tell us that, that centurions would kill their slaves if they didn't cook the food they wanted or if they put up the wrong clothes that they didn't want to wear that morning. They would just kill them. But this centurion loved his slave. The next thing we know is that when the centurion heard about Jesus, now remember he is a pagan, but he heard about Jesus and he sent some Jewish elders to call Jesus to him. Now if there's anyone that a Jew hated in Capernaum, it was the Roman Empire and the centurions were a very symbolic of that um, power. In addition, for the Jewish establishment, the other people that they hated was Jesus. Because here this man came and tore apart their nice legalistic, ritualistic religion. So we have these Jewish leaders who are going on behalf of someone they hated to talk to someone they hated. And they tell Jesus, he's worthy for you to come do this. Being worthy was a big deal in the Jewish faith. And then they say, he built a synagogue for us. And you think, wait a minute, a Roman centurion built a synagogue for the Jewish people? Centurions were taught to worship the Roman Empire. They were pagan. They were idolaters. But somehow this man had come to see that the God of the Jews was the true living God. And when he came to that conclusion, he built a synagogue for the people, which I'm sure raised a lot of eyebrows with the Roman Empire. Then as Jesus says he's going to come, he starts going to the man's house. He says, wait, you don't have to come to my house. Just say the word and I know he'll be healed. Wow. This pagan recognizes the power of Jesus. And Jesus' response, he was amazed at his faith. This centurion, the living, breathing example of a disciple, embodies great love, great generosity, great humility, great devotion to God and God's people, and he believes in the power of Jesus Christ. In other words, in this encounter, Jesus is saying to the establishment, listen, it's never been about your heritage. It's not about your ethnicity. It's not about your family tree. It's not about what you've done or what you deserve to get. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. You know, so often we think faith in terms of, you know, we have to go to church every Sunday and we have to give 10% and we have to quote scripture. But that's not what Jesus is saying. The Pharisees did that. The centurion didn't do that. And yet Jesus said he had more faith than anyone in Israel. You see, faith has to do with our hearts. How we live out what is in our hearts. What we do when we are outside the walls of this place. As 1 Corinthians says, If I have all faith is to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. My first job after college, I taught elementary school. And on the faculty, there were those who wore their faith as a badge. And we all know people like that. Um, they talked about how spiritual they were, and they wore their, you know, Scripture T-shirts. I'm not saying anything bad about Scripture T-shirts. I wear them. But they talked about everything they did at church. And then they gossiped about everybody. And they talked about how bad the kids in their class were, and they criticized the parents of the kids in their class. Y'all know what I'm talking about if you've ever taught school. 
Um, and they had cliques. Oh, there were cliques at my school. But there was one woman who was different. And she didn't talk about her faith, but she lived it out. She was a librarian. Now, in a school, the library is where every teacher has to come at some point. So every teacher came through that library and knew her. And she never said a negative word about anybody. When people were gossiping, she didn't enter in. She would say something positive about the person they were talking about. When kids misbehaved, she went out of her way to do extra loving things to really embrace that child and let that child know that they were precious and beloved. She listened to people, but she didn't criticize. She was present. And she welcomed new folks to the faculty. She went, she was, uh, boundaries didn't stop her. She went through all the cliques and was friends with everybody, was not a part of a clique. It was months after I met her that I discovered that she was a Christian. I was not surprised at all because her actions communicated the love of Christ. She lived out her faith by what she did, not by waving some banner going, look at me, I'm a Christian. Year, a couple years later, she was diagnosed with cancer, and she met Jesus at a very young age. And throughout her whole battle, she continued to offer love and grace and acceptance to people. She is one of the most loving people I've ever known, and I would say she had amazing faith. I have to wonder, if I'd been alive when Jesus was walking this earth, would he have been amazed at my faith? Would my life have amazed him? How about yours? You know, Jesus came to be in relationship with us and to give us an abundant life. He came and called us his friends. He came and accepted us and just gave us this amazing amount of love. May we allow his love to so transform our hearts that everything we do flows out of that love and that we are surprised by people who show us that love and grace and that when others encounter us, they are amazed by our faith. Let us pray. God, you've loved us so much. You've touched our hearts and accepted us when we feel unworthy. We are so grateful for that. Lord, touch our hearts in such a powerful way that every word we say and every move we make shows forth your love. May our faith be so strong that it amazes all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.